So some of you know there was a big race yesterday up in Kentucky. You probably didn't know that my friend Oli was there. You know, Oli goes all over the place, and he was there at the Kentucky Derby yesterday. And as he was milling around the crowds there at the Kentucky Derby, he ran into his buddy Sven. Sven gets around too, you know. So Sven sees Oli. He says, hey, Oli, how you been doing? He said, oh, Sven, I'll tell you, I bet on the most polite horse here. He said, how'd you know he was polite? He said, well, he let all the other horses go first. <laughs> so our, our reading today is a very intimate one. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples and he tells them at this moment as he is preparing them for what's to come. And what is to come is his death on a cross and then his resurrection. But how in the world can he get these people to understand that, right? They're caught up in this moment. They have no idea what's going to come next. So he gathers them together and he tells them. He gives them the commandment, the one commandment. You know, we've had 10 from Moses. There's one from Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. And he says this to them. He says, this is, this is the new situation you're going to find yourselves in. You've thought of yourselves as my servants and my disciples, but I am calling you my friends. Because there's no greater love than the love that someone would lay down their life for their friends. So he's telling them this, but they don't know. They don't know yet that he's about to die for them. They have no clue. We know it because we're the fly on the wall in that room. We are overhearing these words spoke very intimately to the disciples. But the, the whole trick of this passage is that while Jesus is speaking to his disciples there in that room, he's also speaking to us. Because he knows that we're that fly on the wall. He knows we're overhearing this. This is why it is recorded this way. Because these are words to us down through the ages. So as we're hearing Jesus say this, saying, you are my friends, not just my servants. As we're hearing him say, well, what does this mean? It means that you are to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. That he's not just telling these few people but he's telling us today that same thing. At least if you have faith in him, you will hear those words, not just words spoken to somebody 2,000 years ago, but words spoken to us, his disciples, but not just disciples, his friends. And it's about faith. And faith is the key, really. To, to, to understanding the meaning of this, or to making it more real than just history written in a book. It's all about faith. and A lot of people don't understand faith. And I, I, I tell this story, and I told it before. You, that's how you know it disturbed me. But I've told this story before about the, the window salesman that came to my house. We needed windows in our house. And the guy came, so I'm like, okay. And after the first hour of his demonstrations of his windows, I thought, well, they're pretty nice windows. Maybe I'll get these windows. After the second hour of his demonstrations of these windows, I thought, well, they're pretty nice windows, but I'm not getting them from him. <laughs> after the third hour of his demonstrations of these windows, I was like, I'm never buying a window in my life. I don't need windows. I'm good to go. And he turns to me at that point because he could see he was losing the sale. I said to him, look, I'm not buying anything today. They try to get you to sign right there and then, right? I said, no, not, I'm not buying any windows today. He said, well, what kind of pastor are you if you have so little faith? <laughs> I'm telling you, the window salesman. And, you know... 
Obviously, he never read the book of Hebrews. Because that's where you find the definition of faith. The book of Hebrews says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen, right? So he had no idea what I was hoping for at that moment. I was assured of the hope that my knuckles would meet his nose very soon <laughs> if he didn't get out of my house. And that was a pretty strong conviction at that moment. But we throw that word around faith all the time. Do we really know what it's about? Well, it's a kind of murky word, faith. It sounds like it's really solid, but really the way we use it, we use it in a lot of different ways. And it, there are certain levels to faith in the ways that we use it. For instance, the first level of faith is just a, a belief system that you might have an understanding of the operating principles of the world, right? The world works a certain way, I have faith that it works that way. You know, even as we're babies, we kind of learn that, you know, if you cry, someone's going to feed you, so you have faith and you trust that that's what's going to happen, that becomes part of your belief system. We have belief systems about, you know, if I wake up in the morning, the sun will be up. You know, because I always wake up after the sun has risen, right? <laughs> My faith is that the sun will rise tomorrow. I may not see it. It may be behind the clouds, but I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then something so catastrophic has happened that it doesn't really matter anyway, right? So I kind of live with the expectation that I'm going to, you know, have another day tomorrow to live with. I live with the expectation that the world is round. I had some people come to me one day and try to convince me that it was flat, they said, there are YouTube videos. I'm sure that that NASA space shot, that was all made up. <laughs> and they were sure that that was all faked, right? The moon landing and space shuttles and all that stuff, that was, you know, that was all fake. And I'm like, but you know, like Galileo and all those guys kind of proved that a long time ago, just by the fact that when you're on a ship and another ship comes over the horizon, you see the top of it first and then... The rest of it later, because it's coming up over the, because the earth is round. I have that first level of faith conviction in that, that that's the way the world works. So everybody has that kind of faith. You know, if you talk to an atheist, someone who doesn't believe in God, and they say, I don't have faith, I don't need faith. You can say, uh-uh, you have at least the first level of faith because you have faith that there are principles by which the world works. Everybody has that kind of faith. Science has faith. Scientists that do their experiments and make their hypotheses, make them on the basis of faith. They believe in these certain laws, that these laws hold true. And if you didn't have faith, you couldn't build on them. So... There is that level of faith that all people have. You have to trust in something beyond yourself, your belief system. The church has a faith, a creed. This is a creed that has been honed through ages and ages of our best thinkers and our best mystics and scholars coming together and saying this is our tradition. And we pass this on, and, and they're solidified in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and the doctrines of the church. So there's, a, there's a, that level of faith in our belief systems. Then the second level of faith is your own trust in relationships that you have. Trust in relationships. So you grew up in a household. Somebody took care of you. It might have been your mom and dad. And you trusted those relationships to a certain extent. And what a terrible thing it is to meet somebody who grew up in an unstable household where they could not trust their own parents. And that happens. And you see people who are scarred in their adulthood because they are unable to, to form trusting relationships with people. And those people have a very hard time in life. Trust is something very important to us how do you have a friendship without trust? When we hear Jesus saying, you know, I was sent into this world not to condemn it, but to save it. 
that I went to the cross to forgive the sins of the world, there's trust there that is needed to understand that statement. But the ultimate faith, the third level of faith that I'm going to talk about, what we call saving faith, is even beyond that. Because the second level of faith might say, I believe that God made these promises. Learned it in Sunday school. Well, I, I learned about Jonah and the whale in Sunday school. But my understanding of that story, when I learned it at five years old in Sunday school, is very different now as an adult. That kind of faith changes and develops. But then there's this third level of faith that is unchanging because it is a gift from God. It doesn't come from our inner will or our inner spirit or our in, inner ability to apprehend an idea. This third kind of faith is the saving faith that comes through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. So this is the faith by which we say not just that Jesus is the Savior or that Jesus came and healed people, but that Jesus is my Savior. That Jesus came to heal me. It's not just as we read these words written by John in the 15th chapter of his gospel that everybody can say, yeah, yeah, we believe he, he said those things. It is we believe that we are the fly on the wall in that room and that we heard those words spoken not just to the disciples, but to us. Because that same Jesus who called them friends is calling us friends. And when our hearts are open to that level of faith, we are children of God. We are made new. We are born again. And the Hebrews tells about Abraham, who didn't just hear God's word and thought, oh, yeah, that's nice that God said that. He heard that word and it changed his life. He got up and moved from his parents' country to the promised land that God called him to. That's saving faith. That's faith that changes you, that turns you towards God and pulls you in that direction. That's the faith that God calls us to live with. There was a church service where a very rich man lost his wallet. And he went up to the pastor and he said, you know, I, I want you to make an announcement. I lost my wallet and I'm offering a $100 reward for anybody who finds my wallet. Well, there's a very poor man in that congregation who just kind of stumbled over a wallet in that same service. And he picked up the wallet and he looked through it. There's a thousand dollars in that wallet. So he went to the rich man. He said, Sir, I think I found your wallet. He gave it to the rich man. The rich man looked through it and said, Well, I see you already took your reward. The poor man said, what do you mean? No, I didn't take anything out of your wallet. He said, well, there's only $1,000 here. I had $1,100 in my wallet. He said, well, this is exactly what I found, sir, this wallet. He said, well, I'm not giving you a reward. He said, well, you, you promised you would give a reward. I said, he said, you already took it. I'm sorry. He said, well, let's go to the pastor. So the two men went up to the pastor, and the rich man explained what had happened. He said, I had a wallet that had $1,100 in it. This one only has 1000 so I know he took the money. And the other man said, well, I gave it to him. I expected him, he would give me my reward. So the pastor thought about this moment. The rich man said, well, pastor, you believe me, don't you? That I had $1,100 in that wallet. The pastor said, can I see the wallet? So the rich man gave it to the pastor, and he looked at it counted the money, gave it to the poor man. The rich man said, well, why'd you give it to the poor man? The pastor said, well, you said your wallet had $1,100 in it. 
this wallet only has a thousand dollars in it. It can't be your wallet, can it? <laughs> he said, obviously the poor man is honest because he wouldn't have returned it with the money, would he? So we'll just wait and see who turns in a wallet with eleven hundred dollars. There's some amazing promises in our lesson today. If you uh, are born of God, then anything you ask of me will be given to you. What an amazing promise we have from Jesus. Wow, anything we ask. Boy, I bet you could come up with a list right now in your head of some things you'd like to ask God for, some things that would be nice, some new windows maybe, I don't know. <laughs> There's another promise that says in, in our first John reading today that those who are born of God have overcome the world. We've conquered the world. Isn't that great? We're like Dr. Evil. I will conquer the world, you know. But that's, that's not what Jesus is saying here. It's a great story about Paul and Silas when they were in Philippi. They come across a woman who has a spirit of divination. She's got like this demon in her that allows her to tell fortunes. And every time that they're going to, the, to go pray, this girl is running around going, these men are messengers of the Most High God. These men are messengers of the Most High God. And she was making such a ruckus, it was bothering Paul and Silas. So Paul just looked at her and commanded by the name of Jesus Christ that the Spirit would come out of her. And immediately the Spirit went out of her and never came back. Well, this girl was a slave girl. She was owned by other people. She was property. She was used to make money, to telling fortunes, so that she could collect the money and give them to these other people who owned her. And her owners came, and they said, what'd you do to this girl? She can't tell fortunes anymore. That demon is gone. She's worthless to us now. You've, you've destroyed our business. They complain about Paul and Silas. They Paul and Silas, they have them arrested for disturbing the peace. And Paul and Silas are put in jail. There's a jailer who's there to guard the jail overnight. And during the nighttime, there's an earthquake, a big rumbling. And when the earth shakes, all the doors in the jail go open. It knocks the jailer down. And when he gets up and he recovers himself, he realizes the doors have all been thrown open in the jail and he figures Paul and Silas have escaped and it's his job to keep them there so he figures his life is forfeit. So he gets ready to fall on his own sword. He's going to kill himself. And then he hears a sound from inside the jail. He hears a sound and it sounds like, it sounds like people singing. And he kind of tiptoes inside the jail and looks back. And there in the jail cell, Paul and Silas are just sitting back there in the cell. In the cell and they are singing hymns of praise to God. And they have this look of joy on their faces. And they haven't made a move to get up and walk out of the cell. The jailer can't believe it. And he realizes that these people who were able to make a demon flee, must really be messengers of the Most High God. And they come, the jailer says, what do I have to do to have that, whatever it is you have, that's giving you such joy, filling you with this faith? And they said, believe in Jesus, you and your whole household, and you will be saved. He's like, my whole household? And right then and there, the jailer takes them out of the cell, and takes them to his own house so he can show his family what these guys have done. And so they can tell them about Jesus. And they do. And they all get baptized like that. And an hour later, he has them back in the jail cell by morning. It's amazing. That transformation. That faith. And the best part of the story to me when they come before the magistrate and they realize, you know, that they, didn't re they weren't really guilty of anything, 
They're wondering what to do with Paul and Silas. Paul just happens to mention, well, I'm a Roman citizen, by the way, <clears throat> and you can't hold me without a trial. And suddenly, the leaders are like, oh, no, oh, sorry, sir. We're very sorry. Please don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't go to the governor. Don't tell them that we've, we've detained you. Everything's okay. You can go on your way. They have overcome the world by their faith. Where they were about to be arrested, taken in chains, maybe executed. Now they have the leaders on their knees begging them not to tell anyone what has just happened. This faith that understands who God is and who we are in relationship to God is a faith that indeed, if you ask God for anything and you are in his will, you will find amazing things open up to you. You may not find that the path you are looking for is the one God wants to take you on, but if your heart is open and receptive, you will find that that is the path you need to go on anyway. You will have overcome the world and its ideas of who you should be and its struggles to make you into something that you are not. Third level faith is a faith that knows who you are and who God is. And it is open to it at all times. To receive his love and his grace. And to share it with one another. To bear fruit. Not just for yourself. But for all in need. For all who are called God's children. For all that we hear that voice telling us to love one another another. Amen.